this is a huge part that I don't think many people understand as much is that comments and the unanswered comments and whether they have a validation of your product or a rejection is, is like the most important thing that people are going to look at. Because when you see an ad from something you don't know that seems kind of interesting, you're going to click on the comments, right? You, you probably are. You're going to click to see like, is this something people think is interesting? We look for validation from other people. So are there unanswered comments? Check those. Are they validating or rejecting the product? And if they're, if they're rejecting the product and there's a lot of negativity, you probably have some work to do in terms of customer service and customer experience, right? But you also don't need to keep running that ad. You're listening to the E-Commerce Influence Podcast with Austin Bronner and Andrew Foxwell. If you want honest, transparent, and tangible results that deliver lasting value and revenue, this is your podcast. It's safe to say that most of us have been doing a lot more shopping online lately. And if you're an e-commerce brand, that means you might be seeing more first-time customers. Once they've made that first purchase, how do you keep them coming back? That's what Klaviyo is for. Klaviyo is the ultimate marketing platform for e-commerce brands. Klaviyo gives you the tools to build your contact list, to send memorable emails, automate those key messages, and more. A lot more. That's why more than 40,000 e-commerce brands like Chubby's, 8sleep, and Living Proof, including most of my clients, use Klaviyo to build a loyal following. Strong customer relationships mean more repeat sales, enthusiastic word of mouth, and less depending on expensive third-party ads. Whether you're launching a new business or taking your brand to the next level, Klaviyo can help you get growing faster. Plus, it's free to get started. Just visit klaviyo.com slash influence to create your free account today. That's K-L-A-V-I-Y-O dot com slash influence. With SMS quickly becoming the most important marketing channel of the decade, many e-commerce brands are excited to get their piece of the pie, but many aren't sure exactly how to start or run an effective campaign. That's where Postscript comes in. Postscript is an SMS marketing platform trusted by thousands of growing Shopify and Shopify Plus stores. Using Postscript, your team can grow a TCPA compliant subscriber list, use your Shopify data to create targeted text message campaigns, have two-way conversations with your customers, and unlock a brand new marketing channel that drives big time ROI for your store. Don't treat SMS like email. Respect the inbox, create hyper segmented campaigns, make customers happy. Start your free 30 day trial of Postscript today at www.ecommerceinfluence.com slash postscript. That's ecommerceinfluence.com slash postscript, P-O-S-T-S-C-R-I-P-T. What's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the e-commerce influence podcast. My name is Austin Bronner, and I am excited to bring you today a very targeted episode, an episode for you, the e-commerce business owner or agency marketer or agency owner who primarily drives traffic through demand generation through Facebook advertising. Because, you know, I was thinking about how to address what has been going on in Facebook recently. I was thinking about how to be helpful. There is a lot of turmoil. You've got prices going up. You've got instability on the platform. Um, you've got a lot of challenges that have happened. You've got that combined with movies like The Social Dilemma. If you guys haven't seen that, I highly recommend it. That are going to bring even more transparency and scrutiny on advertising through Facebook. You put all those together and it's been a pretty challenging time. Now, if you're one of the few that hasn't been impacted by this, you can really count yourself lucky because uh, for many of my clients, this has been one of the more challenging times to grow their business using paid social. What I realized was that Andrew and I recorded an episode in February 2019. And this episode really has, has 20 questions that Andrew likes to ask to get unstuck with your Facebook ads. And I went back through this episode and a lot of what you're facing right now, if you are having challenges and you are seeing performance drop, a lot of that can be helped by asking yourself some of these same questions. So what I want to do today is bring together these episodes, uh, release it and go back through, revisit it because 
a lot of these questions are the questions you should be asking if you have if you're having trouble right now with your account. So let's dive right into it. Hope this is helpful. I'd love your feedback as well. You can hit me up on Twitter or hit Andrew up on Twitter and uh, let us know. Hopefully this episode is helpful. We'll take you right to it. Today, we're going to be talking about Facebook and you're going to be going over the top 20 questions that Andrew asks when he's doing an audit. So yeah, you can basically. use that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, basically what I was thinking about, and I was kind of brainstorming different episode ideas. So I was thinking, look, there are these things that we went through in one episode of the uh, five step optimization process episode. If you may have listened to that, the RCAB P process, which is a uh, reporting creative audience bidding and placement process that I go through. And if you haven't, that's a good one to listen to. Um, the, uh, but this one is really, these are the questions I answer today, right? These are the tactical questions that I think, um, uh, I look at an account when I'm auditing and I audited, uh, two over 200 accounts, um, in, uh, 2018, uh, and already have done a couple in, in 2019. And so really these are the things I'm asking, uh, on a regular basis, basically. Um, and there's 20 of them, uh, that I, that I utilize, uh, as a kind of a framework, um, to, to see if they're doing, um, and usually, one or two of these, even on the best accounts I've seen run, there's some, some option for you to, uh, to try or utilize these, um, in terms of optimizing and making your account better. What, uh, 100%. And this is where some of the value from having somebody who has done 200 different audits in the last year comes. It's, it's as you do more and more audits and you see more and more accounts, you realize that, there are certain things some accounts do well, the other ones don't do well, and you can kind of take from them and, and shift them around. I did the same thing with email marketing when I run audits. Uh, you find the things that work and start asking the right questions. So why don't we dive into it, Andrew? What is, why, why don't you start with your list of questions and explain it for the layman's out there, uh, like myself, who need some help with some of the Facebook nomenclature and vernacular. Sure. Totally. So, so these are not uh, in any particular order. Uh, these are just, uh, how I have them listed out and the way I think about them. Um, so first of all, uh, user generated content, I, uh, number one, asking if, uh, is user generated content integrated somewhere in the creative? And this can be um, user generated content. Uh, mostly I'm thinking about it in terms of photos of people using your product or wearing your product or um, uh, maybe even how they look after, uh, you know, if you have a, a product that's food or something or, um, you know, some sort of powder, a protein powder or something like that, right? Is, it, is that integrated into your creative somewhere, right? The, re the more real that the creative looks, the better off you will be. It's somewhere in the funnel. Most of the times you're better off using UGC or user generated content in the lower part of the sales funnel, right? Because you're proving to that person, Hey, here's, here's somebody that used it and here's what, you know, they said about it. Right. So, so that's number one is, is, is there UGC integrated anywhere? Because if it's all pretty photos, but there's no real like tactic or excuse me, there's no like realness to it. Um, then you're, you're kind of missing out on that tactic. And that's something that I utilize a lot. Um, this one is coupled really with, uh, the second thing that I go through then, which is, is there, are, are there any reviews integrated into the copy? Okay. So we have a huge test running right now for one of our clients. Um, they're spending, uh, about $20,000 in about a five, day period. And they're testing a lot of copy, um, that is re, uh, testing reviews versus, um, testimonial versus, you know, some other stuff. So like review being straight from them, testimonial being more like canned. And then like the third one being kind of a different type of pitch. Um, and right now the review is working the best, the review from people that have, have had this experience with this product, um, is what's winning. So UGC user generated content, are there photos that you have, that are from Instagram, that they've tagged you, that and you've asked them to use it, um, that you are using somewhere in the funnel. And two, are you utilizing reviews? Are you utilizing reviews are, that are either from Yachtpo, maybe you have that set up on your site, or from, uh, you know, customer feedback and surveys that you're utilizing. And those two things are, are really, really big and, and, it, and normally one that a lot of people miss out on. Or Amazon reviews. Also, if you're selling on Amazon. Or Amazon reviews. Sure, absolutely. there as well. 
Absolutely. Yeah. There was a great company I worked with that was a security camera company and they utilized reviews incredibly well um, that I did an audit for in 2018. And so they were an Amazon first company and, uh, and that was a big part of it. So that's one and two. One being UGC, user generated content into the creative. Number two, reviews being in, integrated into the copy. The third one is, are you utilizing square video link posts? Right now, Previous to, I would say, um, 2018 in a lot of ways, the most popular ad unit that we had was this square photo post, right? And I remember talking, we've talked about that plenty of times on this podcast, yeah, which definitely. is a photo. Yeah, that it's a square photo. You you it, you launch it and it has uh, the copy and then a, a shortened link in it, right? Well, Facebook has given us the, uh, the beauty now of not only link posts, uh, which is what we traditionally had used as a conversion um, ad for a long time. And those were 1200 by 628, kind of a rectangular image. They've now allowed us to put square photos in the link posts. So that helps. And they've in- allowed us to do videos in there. And you can take, you can upload a video into your square uh link post. You can also, so the aspect ratio is one to one. You can also take product photos and put them into a slideshow. So you can create that right within this tool from Facebook called the video creation kit, which is at the ad level of your uh, Facebook and Instagram ads creation tool. So basically, you know, if I'm looking and I'm seeing there's no slideshow or no square video link post integrated, that's a problem. You should be integrating that. You should try them because they work really, really well. And um, Facebook likes them. Uh, users like them. Uh, they allow you to show off video and, and show the product benefits. Uh, and they also allow you to get comments and do social proofing and everything else like tactics we've talked about before. So that's number three on the list. Number four, you talk about product being more than 40 to 50% of the image. What does that mean? Yeah, so the, the number four is... Um, looking at the image uh, that you have or the videos that you have, right? A lot of times what I'll see is people utilizing lifestyle photos. So they'll utilize lifestyle and let's say it's a watch or let's say it's a handbag or jewelry and the photo is somebody wearing it on the street. Well, or have, you know, it's, you can't hardly see it, right? A lot of people are looking at these things on their mobile device. So the more that it pops, the more that that image pops out and, 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 and kind of hits you in the face, the better off you're going to be. So my general rule is look, how can you make the product at least 40 to 50% of the image? Okay. Um, how can you make sure that it's front and center? People know what it is that it captures their attention. Um, because in my experience, those lifestyle photos don't work as well where lifestyle does work in, in, you know, the cases it does is lower funnel, mostly with UGC. So it kind of ties back into number one. So looking at that and saying, all right, look, if you're doing this particular product, we need to see it. The person needs to see what it looks like, why it's interesting, and not just see a lifestyle photo of somebody wearing your backpack or something. Because if they're walking down the street, it looks like every other backpack, right? You have to remember consumers have so much choice. Our potential customers have so much choice. And so in order to really, really reinforce what's special about our product, whatever that particular thing is, we need to make sure that they understand the value prop right off the bat and they can see it and they can see what makes it different. That looks interesting. That looks like something that I could potentially use, right? So that's a big question of, uh, is it more than 40 to 50% of the image? So that's number four. Next one you've got is unanswered comments, uh, which is key, not just on Facebook, but anywhere. <laughs> uh, talk a little bit about unanswered yeah. comments and what you look for there. Yeah. So let's just talk about this. I was actually, um, uh, pretty interesting actually. And I'm going to call these companies out because I think it's actually a really big deal. Um, I saw a Facebook ad, uh, yesterday, uh, for, uh, whole 30 and butcher box, two companies that I really actually respect. I think they've, they've built great businesses and all of the comments, um, there were over 40 comments on the post that I saw. It was an unboxing post. So video. So the person from butcher or from whole 30 was unboxing a butcher box box. And, um, and it's what, if you don't know what the butcher box is, that's a subscription meat box. Um, and they were unboxing it and, and every single one of the comments except one, cause I looked at every single one of them was negative. People saying that the meat had arrived and it was bloody, it had thawed, it it had major problems, and 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 it was there. Some of them were being answered, but some of them were not. So 
this is a huge part that I don't think many people understand as much is that comments and the unanswered comments and whether they have a validation of your product or a rejection is, is like the most important thing that people are going to look at. Because when you see an ad from something you don't know, that seems kind of interesting, you're going to click on the comments, right? You, you probably are. You're going to click to see like, is this something people think is interesting? We look for validation from other people. And so if that's not doing well, that not only will tank your ad results because Facebook will look at that and your relevance score will start to go down because your negative feedback will be high, but you're also really hurting yourself. So I look at that. Do you have unanswered comments that aren't being attended to? A lot of people, when they scale up Facebook ads, this is a part that they completely forget about. And it's on the agencies and us to tell people, hey, look, when we scale, you're going to be on the hook for answering a lot more of these questions, right? And you're going to, and that's okay, right? You want to be able to do customer service. You want to be able to help people and answer questions, um, especially if you're using that social proofing strategy as we've talked about before. So are there unanswered comments? Check those. Are they validating or rejecting the product? And if they're, if they're rejecting the product and there's a lot of negativity, you probably have some work to do in terms of customer service and customer experience, right? But you also don't need to keep running that ad. You can turn that ad off and start a new ad. Like you, you, you can try something different. My point is there's no reason that you need to be spending your media dollars to blast out to the world a huge billboard that people have commented on with a bunch of thumbs down. Like it just doesn't make, doesn't sense. make sense. So it's not going to make dollars. <laughs> right. Be better. Right. Be, be better than that. Right. And you may, and, and, and a lot of what happens in, in subscription box products, of course, and may is what happened. Maybe what happening is what happening here is, you know, they're looking at saying, well, our lifetime value is, you know, $230. So anything below that in terms of um, a subscription sign up is okay. And you may get some people that are going to click through, but again, that doesn't solve the core problems. So, you know, there's different things you can do. You either need to interact with them or you need to stop that ad and start a new one. And you don't need to be disingenuous about it, but there, there, it may be, you know, that you want to just hold back off of paid media for a while. Once you fix why the fact that these things are being sent around the country and thawing, that's an issue. Right. And so, a lot of times I work with people too to develop content off of the FAQs that are in the comments. If you have FAQs about, you know, hey, why did this get shipped the wrong way? Or, hey, you know, this, this didn't really work or what makes it different? Develop content on your site that you can link to people in the comments. So that's a big one. Unanswered comments. I see that a lot and people will say, you know, this ad was doing well and then it stopped doing well. That's, a pro that's the reason why. So that's number five are there unanswered comments and validation or rejection? So those are some of the, the things that I'm looking for. The number six is, is there a discount integrated at some point in the funnel? I'm not saying that everything has to be discounted. I'm not saying it has to be a massive discount. There's a client I work with, their AOV is $170 US and their discount is $15 off for first time purchasers. Not an incredibly great deal, but there is a discount in there that gives people some incentive to try it. This particular person I'm talking about is a clothing retailer, all made in the U.S. People love their products. However, again, tons of consumer choice. So you've got to give them some reason and some incentive for first-time customers to give it a shot. Otherwise, why? I mean, the quality and the in integrity of your product is great. And I'm glad that you're doing that. And I'm glad it's made in the U.S., but it's not enough to get people to try it. We have a lot of choice there. So is there some sort of discount integrated for first-time customers is number six, the thing I'm looking at when I'm trying to do a lot of these audits. I'm going to take a breath because I'm speaking at like an auctioneer's well, pace these currently. Are, but uh, but what do you think about that? These are all just good marketing, right? So all of these things, it's it, when it comes back to it, it's, it's good marketing. It's providing an offer. Um, it's making sure that your comments on your site, any forward facing um, comments and reviews are answered and are positive uh, that you can see that all these things are just really, really good marketing and focusing on, on that. So hundred um, percent on board. Number seven, a lot of people think about, um, you know, Hey, I had an ad set that was running. It was doing really well. Right. And then it kind of died. So I always ask the question of, have you actually stopped that ad set? Did you duplicate it and then run it again at a lower budget? 
doing the same thing. That's a common strategy that not a lot of people know and not a lot of people do. So things don't have to die. And sometimes when you re-enter it into the algorithm, um, it can really help to give something that was once dead a little bit new uh, new life, frankly. So that's another thing I look at of, hey, do, have you start, Have you just duplicated this and ran it again um, to doing the exact same thing that you were before at a lower budget and tried to scale it up? Uh, Justin Marshall, who we've had on several episodes, he talks about this as something he likes to do. And he has seen life come from ad sets three, four times that he's able to run it, especially for 1% and 2% lookalikes that kind of wear out over time. You run that till it starts to show you diminishing returns and your first time impression ratio is low. And then you stop it, duplicate it, lower the budget and run it again. So that's number seven. That's a very easy stop. one to do. And if you do nothing else, that's one that can, can jumpstart a, a good ad set. Absolutely. Number eight is thinking about, have I introduced new prospecting audiences based on dynamic pixel actions? A lot of us say, I had this lookalikes or I had these 2% lookalikes. They were built off of my purchasers. And that's what I've been relying on. That's great. But then the question becomes, if you want to horizontally scale, which is introducing more audiences over time to um, in different ad sets instead of vertically scaling, which is just raising the ad set budget of one ad set to one particular audience, utilizing more lookalikes off of those dynamic pixel actions, meaning ads to cart, top 25% website custom audiences, two-time page views. So when was the last time you integrated and introduced new prospecting audiences based off of things that are updating? As long as those pixel events are firing, add to cart, view content, initiate checkout, whatever it is, right? As long as you're driving prospecting traffic in, those are going to keep updating and they're going to update the lookalikes every 72 hours. So it's a way to continue to generate that new traffic. And a lot of times when people say this was doing well, and then it started to die, I'll look and they'll have, they'll have be, you know, they will have been running, excuse me, prospecting audiences to two audiences and they've never really changed it. And so you've got to make sure that you're always experimenting with, okay, you know what? I'm going to try some new dynamic pixel action prospecting audiences and I'm going to try them too at different sizes, maybe a 2%, maybe a 4%, right? And maybe even a 10% or something like that, right? So basically the question of number eight is, have I introduced new prospecting audiences based on those dynamic pixel actions? Because you have to make sure that you're always testing and trying to bring new people in. And on the uh, side of prospecting as well, another one, uh, number nine, am I trying broad match dynamic product ads layered with interests. If you have a product catalog, you can utilize broad match dynamic product ads for prospecting. And a lot of times you can layer them with general interests. So we have a client that sells jewelry. We have the broad match dynamic product ad running, which is finding people likely to buy products that I am advertising from my catalog. It's layered with our compet. We have one that's uh, running layered with our competitors. Then we have another ad set running that's layered with the broad match DPA with a jewelry interest. Then we have another one that's layered with term bracelets as an interest. Okay. So that it's not that complicated, but a lot of times broad match dynamic product ads are forgotten about, and they can be a really, really powerful vehicle to drive in a different type of prospecting traffic too. So that's number nine. Am I doing broad mesh dynamic product ads? And then the final one of number 10 is have I split my dynamic product ad time windows separating the ads to cart and the view content, right? That's something we've talked about a lot on this podcast before. But if you're doing a 90-day view and add to cart, that's not necessarily treating your customers with the best uh, uh you know, treatment they can get, right? So if somebody that viewed something versus somebody that added to cart something, it you know, is totally different type of customer. And the time window is really important. And it feels counterintuitive. I have a very small brand that we work with. They spend about $4,000 a month. And I actually created a four day add to cart for them. And that's now at a 10 X because it's, it knows that that's much more relevant and the relevant score is higher. And therefore we're getting better results versus doing something like a 30 day, which is what I had running before of add to cart. So Splitting out the DPA time windows, separating ads to cart and view content is really big. 
Number 11, do I have too high of an audience overlap? That's a question that I look at. And what this means is um, you're able to go into the audiences section of Facebook and you're able to look at two different audiences as long as they're each 10,000 or more and you get to select audience overlap. And if the audience overlap is north of 30 to 35%, then you need to put those ads in the same ad set. So basically, you don't want to be targeting the same people separately. Um, you want to make sure that as you're scaling, one of the things is you have separate audiences that are doing different things that are from different types of people. Um, but ma and many times your engager lookalike audience is going to be different than your website custom audience or your purchaser audience, but sometimes they're going to be the same. So you want to make sure that you're not cannibalizing yourself in the Facebook auction. So walk, walk me through that just one more time. Mm -hmm. So if you are, if you've got two audiences mm -hmm. and if they have audience overlap of what percentage? 30 to 35%. Okay. Mm -hmm. Or more. Or more. Yep. So basically what you're looking at is, so here's how you know this is an issue. If you're, if you're, if you're looking at your ads and you have a, let's say some 1% lookalikes and you have a 1% lookalike of your website custom audience, uh, you know, site visitor, right? Yep. You have a 1% lookalike of your purchasers. All right. And you're running those two things in different ad sets, which is totally fine. Um, you know, and you can do that to a certain level. You start to scale them, they're doing well. And you notice that the efficiency slows down. One of the things that you could be running into is you actually are overlapping in the auction. So sure, that's, you know, basically what it means is you need to put those in the same ad set, then you will be more effective within that. And would you do the same thing with retargeting uh, yeah. audiences? <laughs> yeah, you can. Retargeting definitely is, is a way that you can think about that. The way you're, you're less worried about this with retargeting, generally speaking, because you'll, you will have overlap with retargeting and the audiences also won't be as big. So really, this is a prospecting question sure. um, to, to, to make sure that you're doing that. Now, the other thing that I think is big here is talking about, yeah, those different types of users and making sure that those different types of users, um, you're separating them out, right? You're not just, don't just lump everything in together. Don't just lump your website custom audience of your page visitors and your engagers and your, you know, uh, purchasers and lookalikes of those all in one, you can separate them out. They're different types of lookalikes, but you want to check that on the audience overlap. So that's the, that's number 11. Now, number 12 is have I tried or requested value bidding? Okay. Just was talking to a colleague in uh, New Zealand. He just got value bidding and that's very exciting. And value bidding, what this does is it finds people that are the most likely to spend the most money. So that's why is, that's amazing, right? <laughs> so basically it's a limiting factor. It's value bidding or what's called a ROAS bid. And so it's a limiting factor in the auction. If you're utilizing a 1% lookalike or let's say a 3% lookalike or something, right? And you're using conversions, normally 10% of your audience is going to be within that conversion campaign, right? And that conversion objective. Now, out, out of that, value is in, is in narrower bid. It's a, it's a type of bid, basically. And so it makes it a little bit smaller. So you have to make sure that your audiences are big enough to use a value bid, but it works really well because it finds the most valuable people um, and helps you to increase your average order value and things like that. So that's a really awesome tactic that if you haven't used it, worth trying and worth giving a shot to. And with value bidding, mm -hmm. that requires you uploading audiences that have like with their lifetime value. Right. No, it actually doesn't. So value bidding doesn't require that you have to do that. It uh, actually just, um, you just get to optimize for value. So you're just finding people that Facebook is finding people that it knows are more valuable based on their previous e-commerce sure. transaction history from Facebook. Yeah. Sure. I mean, the, the, the history that they have of people making purchases is insane. Right. It's like, like, like Amazon, they, they yeah, know exactly what you buy and they know the people that go from browsing Facebook to 
buying on Facebook right. and then come back to browsing on Facebook to go back to buying on Facebook. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. And <laughs> there's, the, you the know, cycle. there's brands to give you an idea of this. There's brands I know that are in major scaling mode, major, major scaling mode. We're talking north of 500,000 a month in spend that they're, that they're pushing out there on Facebook and Instagram. And they are exclusively using wide audiences, no lookalikes, nothing, just U S wide country wide. And they're optimizing for value. And that's the yep. only thing they're doing. And with, you get, and so, yeah, you get a seven day click or a seven day view bid with a value bidding. And so you want to try the seven day click initially for sure. It, it's very similar to what Jeff Sheldon was talking about. Jeff mm-hmm. Sheldon, uh, he ran a Kickstarter for a company called Gather and they were targeting super backers, right? Which is very it, similar exactly. to the value, value bidding. Super backers are people who buy on Kickstarter. And um, there's, you know, if you know, if somebody's bought on Kickstarter before, there's a higher likelihood that they will buy again, especially if they bought three or four times on Kickstarter. And that's a equivalent of a value bidder. Uh, so tell me a little bit more about bid override and number 13. Yeah, what so, is your tip number 13? Yeah. So number 13, have I tried a bid override lately? So if you're sitting around and you're feeling like, man, you know, things are getting a little stale on this account. You know, the question is, have you tried a bid override? And what a bid override is, is this is um, uh, something that I was doing in 2015 that now has been been popularized called the bully method by a guy named Tim Bard. And Tim um, talks about it. And anyway, no big deal that I was doing in 2015. Neither here nor there. Anyway, what it is, is you're allowed to go in and you get to say, all right, here's my bid. I have a seven day click, one day view auto bid. Below it, it says set a bid cap. So you can click that and you can enter in a a number. Normally, a bid override would be if your CPA is, let's say, $100, hypothetically, you would bid like $500, right? Now, there's also strategies. And so that basically bullies, quote unquote, other people out of the auction and then allows your ads to win. So this is a this is a risky thing to do. This is not something I'm recommending that you do right out of the gates. But if you've had audiences that you feel like are just you're not getting in front of or you feel like things are stale or you feel like you know that you deserve more traffic than you're winning, maybe you're in a really competitive space, a bid override is something that you can do to scale. So that's an interesting one. And what will happen when you do it is basically the first 72 hours, it kind of costs rise and then over time it comes back down. Now, another thing that you can do with a bid override is you can do something to be more conservative. So you can do an inverse bid override, which would be if your CPA is $100, you bid override and you make it 50 And then you slowly walk it back up towards 100. So it won't spend your full budget. It's a way to throttle things, but it does help bring your ROAS or return on ad spend in line. So that's another interesting thing you can try is trying a bid override. And I look at that with an audit. So basically like, okay, things are going well and then they kind of started to be stale. Once they started to be stale, I'm like, hmm, maybe they need to integrate that. I was talking to a colleague yesterday, a person that is a podcast listener was doing a coaching call. He had been trying bid overrides and he had auto bid running and then he tried a bid override. And on the bid override, he said it it was basically doing okay, not great, just higher costs for the first four or five days. And so he's actually kind of cutting budget on it. But it it depends on the account where it's going to work. It's not something I utilize a lot of, to be honest, but it is something I can use to invigorate the scale. When you move from somebody, you said if somebody's a CPA of a hundred mm-hmm. and you put a bid override of $500. Mm-hmm. So the idea is that it would spend up to $500 for your CPA. Yep. For your CPA. So you're, yeah. You're giving it more room to run. And this sure. is basically, this is a way that I used to make sure that all of our clients would, would crush basically. And this is something you heard me talk about in Q4, right? You use utilize yep. the CPC bid. And so it's a similar concept, although you're still in the conversion auction. Um, utilizing that, that bit override. So yeah, it's an interesting tactic. It's something that if you're looking for eyeballs and looking to aggressively like spend more money, it's also something you can do. Again, though, you need to be very careful with it. You need to be confident in your landing page. You need to be confident in your creative and you probably need to be social proofing because otherwise if you start spending a bunch of money on stuff that doesn't have likes, comments, and shares on it or any sort of external validation, you're shooting yourself in the foot because more people are going to see it, but then they're like, why do I care? Right. So that's a big part of it. Sure. So let's talk, let's talk a little bit about, well, what, one last point on that. Mm-hmm. If you're in a position when you, where you have a deadline, right? A deadline. Yeah, or, this is a great idea. 
but this is when we typically would would use it right over like the, the last 24 hours that's sort of the idea yeah or yeah like so so you know the, the most aggressive thing you can do is um if you have something you're like oh, i really want as many people as possible to see this in my let's say their previous purchaser audience you could um and it's there's a time window on it right like a sale ends at 7 p.m tonight or something you could do a bid override and then set that date or you could do a bid override and then below the bidding area there's a thing called accelerated spend and you can click on and it says spend and you can spend evenly is the win the button you can press or it says accelerate the spend and it, it'll accelerate it and make sure that you're winning more auctions faster so that's another way that you can use this so again it's it's a little aggressive but it's something that's possible for getting in front of the most people that you possibly can cool now on what? number 14 previous customers how much do we love previous customers? I mean, this is something you talk about all the time, right? This is a, this is love the, them. This is the Austin Winback idea. You love them. The previous customers, you know, everything. the The ability to forecast whether or not somebody is going to make a purchase in the future is defined by how much they bought in the past, when they bought and how much they spent. So yes, a hundred percent love previous purchasers. <laughs> totally. And so the big thing that, you know, somebody I saw the other day, um, uh, put this on and, and I thought it was interesting, put it on Twitter and said the number one metric that people should be paying attention to with their Facebook advertisements in 2019 is what's your repeat purchase rate, <laughs> right? And a lot of times I will audit accounts and I will see absolutely nowhere are people targeting the people that have already bought from them. So that's obviously an issue, right? So one, are you advertising to previous purchasers with new, new content, new products, other things you want to tell them, right? That's one opportunity through a conversion campaign. The other thing is, are you taking the ads that are going to prospecting and are you social proofing them through a page post engagement campaign to to your previous purchasers. There's nothing better than when you have comments on the ad from previous purchasers that say, love it, can't wait to get more, worked great for me, right? So that's a huge, huge, huge deal. And that's something you want to take advantage of is, are you advertising to previous purchasers? Another big part of the audit. And just to, just to go into that a little bit, <laughs> when you are advertising to previous purchasers. You mentioned it briefly, but you mentioned putting out other products or complementary products. Mm -hmm. If you are running a business that doesn't have complementary products or products people can <laughs> buy in a repeat way, then you don't need to advertise to them, right? It's not going to be something that's going to be helpful for you. Right. If you've got a one and done type purchase, that's they're only going to buy one there. That's, that's the only thing that's ever going to happen. Well, then we don't recommend advertising to previous purchasers, but I would recommend figuring out a complimentary product and find something, build something to be able to sell to previous purchasers, because that is where you're going to be able to, if you're having trouble scaling your business, uh, it probably has to do with the fact that you just have one product. Right, right. And that goes kind of into number 15, which is, have they tried product bundling to bring up the AOV? Okay. So basically, you know, one of the things I'll see when auditing accounts is they'll say, my ROAS is really low. Okay. My return on ad spend is low. I can't break a two, you know, I can't break a two X. Okay. All right. Well, then the next thing I'm going to look at is what's the average order value? I mean, what's the price of the product, right? There's a company that we worked with and have really helped them grow with another agency we work with. They sell deodorant. Okay, great product, low AOV, right? So now all they're doing is they proposed to this particular client, the agency, and they accepted. They're now selling six packs. That's it. That's all that they sell online. That's really what they push. You can buy individuals later. Um, and you, if you click further into their site, you can buy individuals. But most people want to buy, you know, the, the six pack right out of the gate because it's discounted heavily. Right. So it's, it's much cheaper just to buy six of them. And if you don't like it, they have a 30 day guarantee back. You know, you can, you can send it back. Right. So that's a big part of it that I look at, which is if there's if the return on ad spend is low has this person tried product bundling? How do they, have they tried actually putting together things? Another client you and I know, well, they sell baby clothes. Well, one of the things that they were putting on their Instagram was they were putting uh, outfits together, but they were never selling those outfits together on their website, 
right? Makes sense. If you think the outfit's cute, you might want to buy the whole dang thing. So trying that, and, and then we started advertising those outfits and those started to do well. So product bundling to bring up the AOV is another part of it. I got a couple, I got two more examples of that. Yeah. Um, because I think this is a really, really important thing to think about, uh, especially, so I'll give you an example from, there's two skincare companies mm-hmm. that I've worked with and they've both had, they both had different strategies, both equally successful on, on Facebook advertising. One of the strategies was like you said, a bundle, they bundled and they moved their average order value up to north of like 160. Uh, so they could really spend to be able to bring people in and they, they pretty much only push the bundle. That's it. You know, it's, it's a full skincare package bundle that works for them. On the flip side, another company I worked with took the complete opposite uh, path and they actually went down to pushing a free trial and the free trial plus free, free trial plus shipping. Mm-hmm. But the difference between the two, the, the goal was exactly the same, which is be able to get conversions at a price that they can afford. And the free trial allowed them to get conversions extremely cheaply. The product bundle allowed them to get conversions at a higher price level and they both worked. But if, if you're struggling, those are two strategies you could look at. And more often than not though, the product bundling, unless you have a, a product that can be a free trial is going to be the one you're going to end up on to try to increase average order value. Totally. And that's a really good point. Yeah. The, 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 you know, a lot of times I think when you do something like a free plus shipping, it's not a bad idea. It can totally work. You get a ton of people in the ecosystem, but you're not doing true cost accounting on that, right. Of, of what you're, of all the stuff you're sending out and then all of the administration you have of, you know, getting people to, you know, sign back, sign up fully. And, you know, there's a lot of stuff that has to go into that. So it's interesting, but yeah, that's the one thing I look at, right? If, if, if the ROAS is low, it may, it may be that your strategies are doing really well and your ads are doing well, your audiences are doing well. Right. But it could be that just, you're just the AOV, you're just not making that much money. Right. So, um, so how can you do that? One other client sent people into a product page that was a, excuse me, a bestseller page that was not just a bestsellers. It was of basically their bestsellers, hypothetically, that had, <laughs> it wasn't their true bestsellers. It was the, the things that they had the best margins on, but they said it was bestsellers page. And that did really well. So that's not, I mean, you know, not saying you need to be disingenuous, but something to think about in terms of bringing up that AOV, I think is really smart. <laughs> I would say you, if you're going to do that, you should not say, these are the products with my, our best margin. No, you <laughs> should say that. sounds a lot better. Correct. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, so then the number 16, am I remarketing to engaged users? Um, remarketing to engaged users is something I don't see very often. You can create engagement custom audiences on Facebook and you can create lookalikes of those engagers. And you can create the engager audiences, engager custom audiences from Facebook and Instagram. So, you know, you're kidding yourself if you think that your Instagram engagers and your Facebook engagers are the same. They're not actually. They're very different. Yesterday I was speaking to on a coaching call to a guy and he sells pet products. Okay. Well, he gets a lot of engagement. His Facebook engagers are average age much older than his Instagram engagers. Makes a lot of sense, right? So creating lookalikes of those is a big deal. But but the really the core rule is are you utilizing those in the middle part of the funnel? A lot of people are going to see your ad. They're going to comment on it. They're going to look at the comments. They're going to like it. And then they're going to leave. They're not, they're not going to go to the site, but they're going to be intrigued, right? And so if you're, in, if you're remarketing to those that have engaged, that can be a really, really smart thing to do. And it can help build out a middle part of the funnel for you. The mofo. The, mo, the, the mofu. Mofu, not mofo. Mofu, mofu. <laughs> yes. <laughs> exactly. Now, number 17, what does my age report breakdown look like? This is essentially looking at your advertisements. If you go on the Facebook ad manager and you go, there's a campaign ad sets and ads, right? Within your ads manager, those are the tabs. And then there's the account tab on the left. And if you click on that account tab and you scroll all the way to the bottom on the right hand side, you can click into breakdowns and you can click into the breakdown menu and break it down by age and gender. 
Okay. And so this is essentially one thing I like to do in audits is a lot of people have their ads targeted at 18 to 65, or they'll have them targeted at something like 25 to 55 or whatever, who knows, right? But they're not necessarily separating those two things out. And one thing you can do in terms of a horizontal scaling methodology, which is adding more components to your ads is splitting things by age or you can refine things by age. Maybe you're realizing that, man, I've been advertising to from, you know, to people 65 uh, or excuse me, like 25 to 65 plus for a really long time. And I've spent $300 or $3,000 on people that are 50 and older, but their CPAs are like 40% more. And you can understand where you're, you know, where those boundaries are. So looking at that age report is a really, really helpful thing to help guide, obviously, your targeting. And it can also help guide um, the refinement of that targeting. Do you see um, when you're looking at the, so just walk me through a little bit one mm-hmm. more time, just exactly how to do it. Cause it was, it was quite quick. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I'm in the Facebook business, you're in your ad, you're in your ad manager. Yep. Okay. In the ad manager. Yep. And then and you're in where ad- do you go? Let's go, where, go, go from there to specifically find it. Totally. So you're in ad manager and you're clicking yep. on that and then you go into, you see on the top of your ad manager, um, it says campaigns, ad sets and ads. Those are the tabs that you have, right? And then the one to the left of that says account overview. And the account overview is the one you want to click on. And this gives an account overview of everything that's been going on. And so if you scroll down all the way to the bottom, you'll see your core data. It says account name, it says the name of your account. And you can see on the right hand side of that, it says breakdown. And you can click on breakdown and you can go to under by delivery and click on age and gender. And this will give you within the time window you have set in the upper right hand corner, a breakdown of the performance by age and gender, which is pretty interesting. So that's where that's at. Awesome. The reason I'm asking is I'm doing it as you speak, Andrew, to see. Yeah, there you go. Just to see, to, to see how, how it's going. So, okay, that makes sense. Tell me uh, a little bit more about number 18. Yeah. Number 18. What is my add to cart to purchase ratio. So this is a huge one. What is the ratio of people that have added a cart to purchase? Do you know that that number is? It's not a number that Facebook reports, but it's a number that I like to look at and break down and pull out into Google Sheets or wherever you want to pull it into Excel or whatever. And a lot of times you can, you'll be able to see, all right, you know, it's, so it depends on the client, but a lot of times you'll see that there, are, it's usually around a 20 to 30% A to, a to C to purchase ratio. And what this can help you do is sometimes you'll have you'll, it's, it's a gauge. And so you'll be able to have ads that are running that maybe haven't had a conversion yet in the first 24 hours, but maybe the A A to C add to cart to purchase ratio is in that 20 to 30% number, whatever it is that your threshold is that you're looking for. And if it lines up to that, then you're doing the right thing. Then you're basically, you can let that ad set run a little bit longer. So that's an interesting thing. And you'll be able to start knowing, okay, this is what my prospecting A to C to purchase ratio is. This is what my remarketing A to C to purchase ratio is. And so that's basically what I'm looking at. Just looking at the numbers there, because sometimes I'll also see that people have shut off ads prematurely. and And I'll be able to prove to them the efficiency of that by saying, okay, you had a really good ad to cart to purchase, you know, add to cart to purchase ratio here, but they, it was from latent conversions that came in later. So that's another thing that I'm able to say, Hey, you know, this one is something you can duplicate and turn back on again. So that's a big one that I really, really like. Interesting. Yeah. And then um, it, go ahead. 19, 19. Have I tried campaign budget optimization? My, my lovely one. Now we'll do a whole episode on campaign budget optimization tactics at some point, but campaign budget optimization is really working for a lot of people right now. It allows you to, and you heard us talking about campaign budget optimization in the episode with um, uh, my colleagues uh, about Q4 and what worked there. And basically what it does is it allows you to set that budget at the campaign level and you build ad sets under it. So if you're running things and you haven't put them into a CBO, I would recommend doing that. I'd recommend trying no more than four different audiences or ad sets in a campaign budget optimization and then letting it run on an auto bid. If you 
um, have that going and make sure that you're also are social proofing the ads across those. And the reason I think this is working right now is Facebook treats these ads differently. It treats them better in the auction and allows spend to be more evenly distributed usually um, across the performance uh, of the ad sets. Now, some people have said, you know, Facebook chooses things a little too quickly. And so there's definitely an imperfect science to it. But if camp, if somebody has not tried it in their campaigns, this is something within an audit I will always mention. Awesome. Well, let's talk, let's talk about the last one, which I think uh, is very, very important and something that when I've looked through ad accounts, when we had the... Uh, the Facebook intensive here in Austin last year it came up quite a bit, mm-hmm. which is naming conventions. Can you talk through <laughs> what do you look for and what people should be thinking about with naming conventions? Yes, absolutely. I will just say that there's never there. It's very common that when I start to audit people's accounts, the first thing they say is, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm like, you don't need to <laughs> apologize to me. Like I, you know, I look, this is what I look at all day. And the thing that's challenging about it is there's no naming convention. And if you don't know what's going on, that's a problem, right? Because if you don't understand the naming convention, you don't understand how to find it, you're going to be lost. So do you, you know, a lot of it is helping people understand that they just need a naming convention. They need to understand, you know, get a handle on what's happening. People have too many ad sets running. It's not, it's like, what's even up, right? So I think, yes, you want to get a naming convention installed and you want to make sure that you're doing one of two things. Well, the one thing that I like is making sure that at a minimum, you're putting at the campaign level, whether it's prospecting, middle of the funnel or or bottom of the funnel remarketing. So at a minimum, you're tagging it with like what it does in the funnel. The other thing that you can do is you can do tofu, mofu and bofu, right? Top of the funnel, middle of the funnel and bottom of the funnel. You can also go through, and I like to do the date in front of every single campaign ad set and the ad. I just write the date one, you know, whatever the date is, five, one, 19 or whatever, right? You can write it out. You can also just actually write the date. I mean, it's up to you, whatever makes sense, but I like to do it by numbers. Now, the other thing that you can do is you can also number them. So you could say, you know, let's say, you could say two is prospecting and three is remarketing and four is middle of the funnel and five is engagement. So everything that falls under those objectives, you put that number in the front so that you're able to filter by that within your Facebook ad results. So that's, that's basically it. There's a ton of different ways to do naming conventions. My bottom line is, look, I don't care what you do on naming convention. You can do what I do, which is basically putting in the date, the campaign, the objective, the audience I'm targeting and the placements, but you don't have to get that anal about it. As long as it makes sense to you, that's what's important. Bottom line is you probably need a naming convention to help make things, make more sense of things basically. Sure. It's more consistency versus anything else. Exactly. As long as it's consistent and you know what it is and you can explain it to somebody else. Um, we're having a conversation with somebody who came out to, intensive and they were talking about how they really, really, really wanted to find and hire somebody who could take over Facebook ads because they were spending so much time in it. But as we hopped in and took a look at what they were doing, they could not even figure out in their own ad account, what was going on. And the first thing I said was, okay, well, that's, that's the first step because you're never going to be able to train somebody to come in and take over until you can even tell, you can look back and see what happened and they can look back and see what happened. So very, very important stuff. Awesome tips, man. Uh, really, really helpful. Uh, this is basically just the Foxwell audit method, (laughs) what you look at, (laughs) what what you look at when you're going through an account. Exactly. Exactly. So hopefully you find it helpful. Let me know if you have questions, uh, Andrew at foxwelldigital.com. And I look forward to hearing from you. Awesome. Well, hope you guys enjoyed that episode. We will talk to you guys very soon. If you did enjoy the episode and you haven't, you've been listening for a while and you haven't, um, given us a thumbs up a review over on itunes uh, you know we're trying to sh- we're trying to grow the podcast this year and that's one of the best things you can do to support is go head over to itunes give us a review and uh smack that 
That's star ranking at five stars. If you like the podcast, we'd love to hear from you guys. Talk to you guys soon. Hey guys, it's Austin. And if you've been loving the podcast, you got to go check out brandgrowthexperts.com. That's where I work one-on-one with my clients to help them build faster growing, more profitable online stores. I've got coaching programs and workshops that we host all over the world. Would love to have you come check it out. If you're a fast growing e-commerce business or you want to be a fast growing e-commerce business, you got to check it out. That's the spot for you. We go more in depth than we do in the podcast with comprehensive trainings and coaching to help you scale up. Check it out. Brandgrowthexperts.com. See you there.